oh, I'm allergic to this poetry. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. It's been forever, I know. And this video itself is honestly two months overdue. Is that the right word? Is that the right way to say it? Anyway, I'm two months late on filming this video and I've had it prepared for so long. It's unbelievable, but I'm just gonna jump right into it. I do wanna say I have seen Rachel Oates' video also reviewing this. So me speaking about this is coming with having already seen that video. I did make my own notes on this first before I watched her video. This is not gonna turn into me talking about what Rachel has said. I think she has many valid points. When I was watching the video, I felt that at times she was a bit too harsh on Gabby, but that's just my own opinion. I do agree with all her points though. I just, I don't know. I think it could have been said a bit more nicely, but I understand the frustration of reading something that you expected would be better than adult adolescence, and it really wasn't. It wasn't up to any kind of poetry standard. A little bit of information about me if you are a first time watcher. I am an English student at St Andrews and my opinion is just that. It's my opinion. If you enjoy this book then I will not deter you from reading it but from an objective standpoint as a literature student there are a lot of failings in Gabby's poetry. I think you can find quite a few positives and I think the ones that I've put a little post-it note on are the ones that I enjoyed or I wanted to speak about specifically. In the grand scheme of things, like however many sticky notes this is, isn't a lot. I really like Gabby's content. She's one of the first ever YouTubers that I ever started watching along with Superwoman. Now I'm still subscribed to her, but I guess her content has kind of changed over the years. She used to do a lot of story times as people watching this video probably know. I'm just gonna stop prolonging this and actually get to discussing the book, which I haven't looked at in a very long time, but I wanted to start off by actually talking about the end. Because of the Simon and Schuster version that I have, I get the bit with those little stories from her childhood at the end, which I really enjoyed. I think it takes us back to when she used to do story times and I loved her story times. I would have enjoyed this book so much more if it was just that, if the whole book was just a collection of stories, short stories, because I love short stories. I recently, when I say recently, I mean over the last nine-ish months, I've gotten into short stories a lot and I think they're brilliant. And I think that if she worked with her editor, she could really be successful at writing a book of short stories. Even though it's not the most articulate or flashy in terms of vocabulary, the simplicity of it drew me in. And maybe it was the fact that I was reading it after I'd read a whole bunch of not very impressive poetry. But I really enjoyed that end section and I wish that that had been the entire book. Maybe I should start off from the beginning. Also, it's important to acknowledge that she has been writing this for three years. She's been writing this since she was writing Adult Lessons, which immediately told me that there wasn't really going to be much of a change. And um, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that. There's a lot of filler pages that I think just didn't need to be there. They were unnecessary, boring, and just quite useless to be perfectly honest. So something like this poem, Cordial. I broke up with my demons, were much better off as friends. That's, I, it's not a poem. <laughs> and it really, it really bothers me that this is considered by people to be poetry now. We were actually discussing this in my poetry module this semester, discussing this in reference to Rupi Kaur because uh, I dislike her so much. Uh, 
and uh, my tutor was saying how he's just grown to accept it now. He's quite a prominent poet in the UK. Sometimes that's just what you have to do. You have to accept that it's there and move on with your life and that's I guess what I'm having to do with things like Gabby's poetry is just accept it and move on. One of the words that Rachel uses a lot to describe this is laziness and she's completely right. It is just so incredibly lazy. What I wrote in my notes, I wrote that this is an attempt at poetry for the sake of aesthetics. It is not utilizing drawings to help aid the words on the page. It is not doodles being drawn to really connect with the words. It is the words that are put there on the page to draw attention to the illustrations that accompany it. And quite interestingly, <clears throat> there are great poets who have used illustrations in their work, one of which is Stevie Smith. Stevie Smith's work was very much misunderstood for a number of years. Her work was suppressed for a very long time, but I think now that it's being given the recognition that it deserves, you really do see interesting concepts between her illustrations and her work. I may or may not decide to include some examples, we'll see if I cut this or not. One of her poems, Not Waving But Drowning, has an accompanying illustration beside it. I think she wasn't very pleased with the fact that they wanted her illustrations alongside her poetry, otherwise they wouldn't have published it, because I think she wanted the words to speak for themselves. Now all anthologies that are printed with her work do have the accompanying illustrations. And I think the reason that that is different is because the illustration adds a different meaning to the poem. It makes you second guess the words on the page. It makes you think about what the author's intent was. Editing Kiki here. I just wanted to note that I didn't actually talk about not waving but drowning. The important thing to mention here is that the narrator, the speaker of the poem is a man, but the accompanying drawing is of a woman who is in water. So then the reader really questions why this drawing has been drawn alongside the poem that is there. Whereas something like Solar, I'm at the bottom of the universe and then up upside down when you're on top of the world, that doesn't really change the meaning of anything when you look at the illustration of a bunch of clouds and an airplane. One of the ones I did like were, there was this one called Clammy, I think on the second page. Seashells spray in disarray, all torn away from their other half. But occasionally, if you search patiently, you'll find the anomaly of two halves intact through tidal waves and being prey, they find a way to stay attached. It gives me faith in true soulmates. My other half awaits my perfect match. I really quite like that one. I think it flows really nicely. I think if her work headed more towards this direction, it would be quite beneficial for her. And also, she's probably not gonna watch this, but I write poetry as well and I don't rhyme in most of my poetry. There's this desire to rhyme everything. And while I, I think that's great, I think that rhyme has to have a specific purpose because that's where modern poetry is headed, that if you rhyme, you are rhyming for a reason. That, that's the only thing I'd say of this like little poem of quatrains. Another one of my notes that I wrote was that the real question is, what are these poems trying to convey? Because I find that there is nothing deeper than the surface level. A good a good poem may not necessarily be allegorical, but it has the ability to convey more than one meaning as opposed to just being the words on the page. So this, for example, one time I watched a fly fall and learned no one's perfect after all. What is that trying to convey to me? I There's no there's no real need to dig deeper into anything because there isn't anything to dig deeper into. The poet is not meant to do all the work for you. You're meant as a reader to do something and engage with the poem in front of you. So the controversial now, but that page that she discussed in one of her videos, the one next to Closet, it's called Nightlight. Daddy, daddy, help me, I'm scared. Darling, darling, what's wrong, little girl? I'm frightened. I don't like the monster in here. Daughter, 
I'll slay this beast that you dread. I'll banish the monster from under your bed. No, Daddy, the monster's not under the bed. I'm scared of the monster that lives in my head. I think I like this one quite a lot, and I think that it's because there's a nursery rhyme playfulness to it. If it, it does need some editing, in my opinion, but I like the message that it's trying to convey. At least this one has a message. But again, it's very surface level. There's that eureka moment at the end and that's really it. We don't get any exploration of anything, which to be fair, poems don't need to necessarily explore things all the time, but it would have been better if there had been some kind of exploration. I love how I'm just reading back my notes from two months ago and having, oh, that's interesting I wrote that. A lot of the time I find myself reading these as one starts off a poem. You randomly get an idea for a line or two and then you have to write it down and later transform it into a poem. So there are a lot of times where it's 2 a.m., I'm in bed just about to drift off to sleep and then suddenly I get this idea of a line or a concept and I have to write it down and I open my notes app and I type it out and then I go to sleep. Otherwise, I will forget it and that's happened to me before and never again. So something like this poem called Tinted. Some people dance like no one's watching. I cry hysterically in my car like no one can see into my window. Something like that is the beginning of a poem, not the poem itself if you understand what I mean. By the way, if people don't understand what I mean, please do leave a comment below and I will do my best to explain my own thoughts. <laughs> Something else I noticed is that it's very drawing book style, as if you're meant to color in the book. Something like this page waves. Life is full of ups and downs. Oh cool, when's the up part? I just, it looks like a coloring book. I don't know, that's just how I feel. So this poem called Ashamed. Mm. So I found myself cringing reading this poem. This is just so, this is just not, uh, you know what it is? It reminds me of doing a class workshop at writing dialogue. It's poorly written because it is not something someone would ever say in real life. I don't think it's something Gabby would say in real life. The line, what's wrong with this imbecile? I have never heard Gabby say that, imbecile. I've never heard her say that. And I think it just, sound is such an important part of poetry. And that's why whenever we read something, it's so much more effective to read it out loud. The tradition of poetry comes from reading things out loud from memory. Reading this out loud, there's no, there's no meter to it. There's no rhythmic aspect to it. It's just words that are put together for the sake of making something, expressing her feelings quite clearly. But I would suggest, I would suggest that instead of writing, attempting to write poetry, you just write a short story about it because surely that is more interesting, a better way to showcase writing talent. There's a bunch of stuff that I just write ditto on. Oh, this one I quite liked. Little by little, pebble by pebble, speck by speck of dust, the mountains eroded, leaving a canyon between the two of us. The whispers were bellowed, resentments were echoed across a cleft so grand, all you needed to close the gap was to reach out for my hand. This one I enjoyed because of the calming details that it had, especially the beginning, the erosion, canyon, all of these landscape words were very interesting. I wish it had been longer. I wish it had led us somewhere. I wish it had explored something except for what it literally was. It could have been such a good poem. I think it's it's okay the way it is, but I think it could have been a really good poem with just some work. And my quite honest opinion is, there are so many po poems in this book. If Gabby had written a quarter of the amount that was in this book and fully worked on it and had collaborations with other poets, other prominent poets, might I add, not someone like Rupi Kaur, she would have actually been able to turn this into something 
really good. There's this other poem where she writes the sentence, breathy and pulsy and not decomposy. And I really just hated that. That line makes me all kinds of uncomfortable. It's no, it just, it didn't work for me while I was reading it and it just wasn't enjoyable. Sometimes I found myself going, is this just the illustration or is this a poem? I really just didn't understand. So there was this poem called Two and it's, it's a bit too long to read, but I found it quite interesting because it's one of her longer poems and I've clearly put the tab there for a reason. I think the reason that I chose this to talk about is because it's something that could have been written so well, but it is a bit, it's overly, actually no, I like the repetition. I like the repetition of the beginning bit and then this conflict of inner self-doubt happening near the end but it's I think there's too much internal dialogue happening here for this to be a successful exploration. I think I may need to give an example here. She says what if this is a beginning? What if this is a beginning and I don't acknowledge it? New, fresh, strange, not yet mine. So I allowed myself to acknowledge you just in case I embrace this beginning painted a picture to look back in our old age just in case. This to me could be improved if there was some kind of imagery, some symbolism, um, perhaps a metaphor or even metonymy in there to allude to something else without saying directly what you mean. Poetry is there to represent the emotions that we can't put into words. Poetry is there to express what cannot be put into words, to attempt to make sense of what we feel and what we think in words that do not exist to properly describe them. If you can describe something, then you write prose. You don't write poetry. So yeah, I just, mm. And then there were some confusing ones that I just didn't know how they would be read, like this poem, Mirror, I really don't understand if the bottom bit is meant to be read, if it's... I, I just... it didn't make sense to me. What I actually wanted to talk about is I wrote an, an essay on death, the theme of death in Philip Larkin and Lewis McNeese's poetry. Death is largely explored by a, every major poet, any poet actually. There's an obsession with the afterlife that seems to haunt all poets. But I think the two poems, Inferno and Ironic, that are next to each other, Gabby fails to delve into death. It's very explicit. There are no layers. And this is a constant theme throughout this book. She doesn't let the reader do any of the work. How is someone meant to engage with, how is it different to reading a text message from someone? Because you're not allowed to engage with what you're reading. This, I obsess so much over the meaning of life, I swear it's gonna kill me. What are you trying to say with that? Why do we care that you've said that? because you've given us no indication, no inward emotion as to how we should feel reading this. It's just a statement. I, I hope I'm making some kind of sense. I'm just going through the book and looking at my notes. I haven't written any kind of a plan. <laughs> oh yes. So we get to the poem Quarantine, which has a lot of repetition. Haha, <laughs> get it? I wrote in my notes, this feels like what you'd write in a private journal and never show to anyone. I find myself reading poems all the time and thinking, wow, I wish I had written that poem or I wish I could write something like that. And then I read this poem and I think, I would be embarrassed to have ever written a poem like that. I put this note on the poem Sword and I said, I wonder if Gabby has read The Wasteland. I don't presume so. Um, the Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, because she, um, she wrote, I let you scatter my ashes across the wasteland of your selfishness. See, I, I would like to think that she hasn't read The Wasteland, because if she had, that would be, ooh, all kinds of problematic. These Checkers poems were just difficult to read. I just found them quite hard to read. 
because of the font and the color and everything. My notes, I will just flash them all up on here, but it's a repetition of me going, again, it's explicit. There's no layers to uncover. There's nothing to deduce or understand, but what is literally right there. There is one classical illusion, but it's done through a drawing. Like my man Atlas over here, yeah, that's a classical illusion, but <laughs> it's just, it's through the drawing. We don't get any of it in her work. And it's so disappointing not to read any of what you're expecting. I liked this one because I thought it was something that resembled a bit more of a poem, but it's so, it's so obvious. If by the title it had been titled something else, then it would have been so much more interesting. If it had been called Good Boy, which is the last two words of this poem, and the word woof had just been gotten rid of immediately, it would have been so much more interesting to unpick. Because you know it's about a dog. You don't need the woof there to tell you it's about a dog. You would understand that while you were reading it. And then it would allow for some kind of, I don't know, mixed imagery where you could think about it in terms of not just it being a dog, but maybe even a human feeling trapped by a master. That imagery, that dualism would have been such an interesting concept to explore. And it's a wasted opportunity in my opinion. Oh, so this one confused me. I just didn't get it. If anyone knows what this poem means, I'd be very happy to hear what you have to say. I was sleeping the first time you told me you loved me, praying I wouldn't hear you, hoping that I would. I wasn't sleeping the first time you told me you loved me, pretending I didn't hear you as hard as I could. Is it just my brain that doesn't understand that? Because it made absolutely no sense to me. Yeah, we've reached the lame poetry. Um, I learned my bleeding heart was my greatest gift of all. It's just, it's not adult poetry. Oh, if anyone wants to call me out on anything, just do it. But I just, I can't, I can't read something like that and think, wow, poetry. Okay, so there's this poem, Lunch, which I enjoyed the first chunk of it. And then it unraveled into nonsense and I didn't understand it. So we sat together and ate our pizza as if everything was okay. We watched together as a bird hopped along with a beetle as its prey. We stared together as the violent bird ripped the beetle to shreds, his ferocious beak tearing away at the beetle's oozing head. I wondered if the beetle understood the permanence of dying. I was horrified. You were fascinated. Both of us fell silent. We sat together and ate our pizza as if everything was okay. So I just think this is quite badly executed. Gabby is the beetle, the other person is the predator, but it just fails to hit the mark that it's meant to. It fails to have the impact that it's meant to have. I wondered if the beetle understood the permanence of dying. It just, mm, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sit right. So there's a lot of childish poetry poetry going on, uh, rhymes here and random childishness there, but then we get very adult explicit language, which I don't think I'm allowed to say on YouTube. The C word, if that helps. Not me writing what garbage with a full stop at the end of it. I think a lot of newer people trying to write poetry, at least especially this occur- this references me as well. When you first start off trying to write poetry that rhymes, you think that the only way that your poem will be a successful poem is if it is an end stopped line or there's a phrase and your sentence is the phrase. But as you read more and more poetry, you understand that enjambement is a huge, huge factor at helping poets make the poem seem a lot more seamless. Like, for example, this is my big chunky bad boy of Victorian poetry. So we're gonna read an excerpt of Jenny by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Lazy, laughing, languid Jenny, fond of a kiss and fond of a guinea, whose head upon my knee tonight rests for a while, 
as if grown light with all our dances and the sound to which the wild tunes spun you round. Fair Jenny mine, the thoughtless queen of kisses, which the blush between could hardly make much daintier. See, there is rhyme in that, a lot of rhyme actually, but because of the enjambment and how the sentence just continues on to the next line, you don't get the same effect as you do with Gabby's poetry, which is, I really don't get it. You see, I'm a catch. You're the shit people reel in and throw back. I'm strong and I'm mighty and have lots of meat. You're measly and useless and boring and weak. The childish rhyme, once again. There are some quite serious issues that she does talk about in her work, which I want to also acknowledge. There's a poem called Codependent. You can bruise me, beat me, hate me and cheat me, but I'll still want you forever. I'll beg you to love me as you beg to leave me. And for that, I blame my mother. That is again, for me, the beginning of a poem. It seems like very interesting concepts that could be delved into with illusion, comparison to other things, but it's just, once again, a bit of a wasted opportunity. This one line that I really liked in this poem called Misophonia, where she says, I want to remove every single one of your teeth and put them into a blender until they're just a fine white powder that I can mix with almond milk and make you suck down silently through a straw and ingest it without making that super endearing, painfully precious, mind-numbingly lovable sloshing sound. The end is a kind of a bit too much for me. It didn't need that many adverbs, but besides the point, they are adverbs, aren't they? Are they adjectives or ad Oh, I'm losing my mind. So I thought that was quite interesting. The, the images that she creates are quite interesting. Oh, I also picked this poem, which seemed kind of... Did did Rachel Oates talk about this? So yeah, Rachel Oates did talk about this poem, so I'm not going to talk about it. So just go and check out her video if you do want to see what that's about. I'll link it below in the description. Should we just keep going? And then the random nudity and I'm thinking, don't you have kids who buy your work? Oh yes, the cliches. Everyone knows when you write, you want to stay as far away as you can from anything sounding like a cliche. And here we have lots of it. Falling in love with you was a slow burn to a gas tank. The fire you ignited was surely worth the wait. A world without you, my dear, is like a burger without condiments. A touch more boring, maybe, but I haven't been hungry since. A world without you is like a burger without condiments. The simile here is just so painful. It is so incredibly painful and just unnecessary. Oh yeah, and then we have um, some a reference to Shakespeare, which she probably knows it's Shakespeare. I, I really hope she knows it's Shakespeare. But honestly, after what she said about the Iliad and the Odyssey. Also a quick interlude, but I just tried to find the video where she says this stuff on YouTube and it's no longer on YouTube so I've had to go and get it from someone else's video that mentions it but isn't that kind of crazy the fact that she just deleted a whole video where she was supposedly defending her old book Adult Lessons. People aren't scrambling very often to read the Iliad or the Odyssey they're great works but it's not what people want to sit down and read. That was that was beyond disappointing. But I was just thinking, a lot of people, there are classic students all around the world reading the Iliad and the Odyssey. In Greek, might I add. It just, it was beyond ignorant to education, which someone with a degree should not be saying. But regardless, that's my mini rant over. She said, what's that thing they say about a rose by any other name? It would smell as sweet, but the line that follows is somewhat disappointing because then she follows it with then my fragile flower turned into a ball of gray so i took a breath and made a wish and blew them all away what is the relevance in mentioning shakespeare and then immediately going to you blowing it away there's a disconnect in those lyrics also the sunset looks really nice right now it's like purple and blue and 
really nice. I'm just going to insert some things that I've said, uh, the things that I've written, because there's too much to discuss, and I would discuss it more, but there's one poem called Redundant, and I've written half this book is redundant. <laughs> oh, and then I don't know about you guys, but it, it kind of struck me as a little bit insensitive to print out a poem in braille when you can't touch it and understand what it is because it's on a piece of paper. I don't know, I just found that a little bit insensitive. And this poem itself reminded me of, um, you know, when poet laureates have are commissioned poems and they have to write a poem about something specific. It reminded me of that as if she was being forced to write this poem. She, she de probably definitely wasn't. I'm not insinuating that she was, but that's what it reads like. It feels like you're reading a forced poem. Yeah, and then assault, she talks about assault as well which obviously I feel very strongly about. Yeah, I think the poem is always on a really good trajectory. Until the line, thank you for letting me tell you. It feels like an easy way out. The poem could have been left unfinished if that was her intention, but having it close like that really wasn't the best idea, in my opinion. <laughs> and then there's this poem called Ramble, and at the end of it, I've just written what with a question mark. We get a bit more of that darkness with the humour in the poem, Anna. She wanted to be a skeleton one innocent Halloween, so she painted up her face and got a pillowcase of candy. She wanted to be a skeleton so the girls wouldn't tease her. She threw out all her candy and tried her best to disappear. She wanted to be a skeleton and so she got her wish. And now she's a pretty bag of bones in a six foot ditch. I quite like that one. Not gonna lie, I found it very playful and exceedingly dark at the same time. And this is one of the few that I can say I genuinely liked. Uh, you can't just go into this book trying to find negatives in everything. I opened this book ready to give it a fair shot. Did I have high expectations? No, but I didn't have any expectations. It was interesting and I definitely gave it a fair shot. I just think it didn't. <laughs> I just think it didn't meet any standard that I have as a poetry reader, as a, as a poetry writer. I wouldn't call myself a poet just yet. You can't call yourself a poet. Oh, I, why did I? Aha! Yes, there's one other poem called Holiday. Met you at Halloween, liked you by Thanksgiving, loved you by Christmas, missed you by New Year's. I really liked that one because you actually get an entire storyline in just four lines and it reminds me of that poem baby shoes for sale never worn that it reminds me of that and i really like this one this is i think one of her best ones in the entire thing because it conveys a deep emotional story in just four sentences and it, it leaves you thinking it makes you wonder like what happened between them you make up scenarios in your own head. So I think that was really inventive. I think that's where I'm gonna leave it off. Rambled on for far too long. But thank you so much everyone for watching. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll get into more of a regular upload schedule now that it's Christmas time. Yeah, I'm wishing everyone a lovely holiday and I will see you next week. Fingers crossed. But yeah, give this video a like if you liked it and leave me a comment below if you had any opinions on Dandelion or if you had anything to say about what I've said. If you wanna argue with me, I don't care. Just leave it down below and we'll have an interesting chat in the comment section. But yeah, subscribe if you haven't so already and I will see you next time. Bye.